From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. It took a pandemic to force us to take a deeper look inside us and around us. And what we saw wasn't very nice. COVID-19 hit all of us. But it can't be any more clearer now that the data is coming out. It didn't hit all of us equally. It will take a while to recover from this. Personally, socially, and economically. But as we saw the numbers emerge, we began talking about the she session. In an already faltering COVID economy, women's participation was at a historic low. Not only that, but racialized, low-income and immigrant women were the hardest hit by the pandemic's economic impact. As part of this, a national childcare strategy was the big promise in September's throne speech, a response to the fact that women have been harder hit than men by job loss due to COVID-19. By creating a Canada-wide early learning and childcare system, we'll ensure that kids have access to care and that no parent, especially no mother, has to put their career on hold. The Star's business reporter Rosa Saba is taking a deep look at the she session and lessons going forward. And she joins me today to talk about the government's dangling promise of nationalized child care, what will it look like, and how it can help regain lost ground and equal participation in an economy that's really going to need it, now more than ever. Hi, Rosa. Thanks for joining me again. Thanks for having me. So we've talked about this before, this devastating economic impact for women during the COVID-19 crisis. And we saw that one of the main reasons was also the disproportionality of labor and how it fell mostly to women to deal with their own work and manage the home and childcare at the same time. It's been a lot. So talk to me a little about how women have been feeling this crunch, what we've termed a sort of she session. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as we know from the data, not only were women hit by job losses at a higher rate than men in Canada, they've also been slower to recover those jobs. We also know that women of color, of course, have been even harder hit, which has been the case in a lot of different statistics concerning COVID-19 in Canada. And, and there's multiple reasons for this. One of them is the reason is that women are disproportionately employed in more precarious jobs. But there's also the fact that women are increasingly staying home to take care of the family during this time. Obviously, there's a lot of kids who, for the first little bit of the pandemic, they weren't able to go to school. Now they're going to school, but every time someone has a sniffle, they have to go home. And it's a lot for someone to deal with if they're also trying to work. And so this is obviously in part due to the fact that women still take on more of the burden of family work, despite the fact that it's 2020. But there's other factors at play. So, for example, we know that men on average make more than women. So if you imagine a two parent household trying to decide which parent is going to go back to work, it's going to be the one making more money. And this disproportionality that we've been talking about, it's going to be very bad for overall our economy, correct? Absolutely. So to put it very simply, if a large number of the workforce just doesn't return to work, those are tax dollars that can't go towards government services, which we need more than ever due to the pandemic. And then again, those are dollars that they can no longer afford to put into the economy, into local businesses, which again, our economy needs all the help it can get as we work to recover from the pandemic. So either way, I mean, you're preventing people from putting money into the economy, which has already been hard hit by the pandemic. And clearly, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance, among other things, of child care, which is mostly done by women as well as for women. So do you think we learned some lessons from this that we might see reflected in government policy going forward? I think that the number of women who are still staying at home and taking care of their children instead of going back to work, that's really highlighted the importance, not just of child care, but of affordable and accessible child care. You know, as we discussed earlier, it's shown that we're maybe not as far along as we think we are, and child care could have something to do with that. And it is clear that the government has heard that and has seen that because this year's throne speech saw the promise of a national child care program. So the government has started the conversation towards a national child care strategy, something advocates have been asking for years as well. Can you give us a little bit of a historic and political background on this? Yeah, so this is not the first time Canada has talked about a national child care strategy, but not by a long shot. It's been five decades since the Royal Commission on the Status of Women first recommended it. And since then, 
Two decades later, another task force recommended it. Paul Martin's government promised it, but it didn't happen due to the election. So while the promise by the prime minister, uh, well, by the government made this year was definitely welcome, it was also definitely met with some trepidation because these promises have been made before, these recommendations have been made before. I think advocates are feeling <laughs> cautiously optimistic. I feel like I say that a lot. But, you know, they're happy to see not just a vague promise, but a promise of sustained funding. So funding over over a long period of time, some talk about working with the provinces and territories, which is a big part of it. So I think they feel that the government has put some thought into what really needs to be done. But of course, now it needs to be done. And that's a whole other ballgame. Right. And what would you say have been the challenges that have prevented a national child care strategy from being implemented so far? Like you're saying, it's been in the conversation for five decades. Well, one of the biggest challenges in creating a national program like this in a country like Canada is the fact that it would need sustained cooperation between the federal government and all of the provinces and territories. So currently, child child care programs are the job of the province. But advocates say that, you know, if you think about health care, for example, you think about the way that obviously all the provinces work with the federal government to implement health care. There's a National Health Care Act that governs it. They say that kind of model would be the kind of thing they want to see for child care. But that's a really difficult thing to implement in a country as big as Canada with so many different provinces. We'll be right back. What is the case for nationalized child care? How would it be better than the current system we see in most of the provinces? Well, for one, a national strategy would hopefully result in more unified services across the country, you know, in terms of oversight, training, cost, accessibility, everything like that. Just kind of looking at it from the big picture, trying to make sure that everyone has access to the same child care, no matter where they live. Advocates hope that a national strategy would also take into account what different communities need and and act accordingly instead of waiting for the market to do so. It wouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach despite being national. It would just have the power of a national program to sort of look at where those gaps are. There's exceptions already. You know, we know that Quebec has had subsidized child care since 1997. That currently costs $8.35 a day. And BC has been running a pilot program of $10 a day, which the provincial NDP has promised to expand upon if they're reelected. Again, you can already see the difference. I mean, there's a difference in cost between those two provinces and not everyone has access to that child care, right? It still is something that's in high demand and there's not enough supply to go around. So there are hopes that a national strategy could even the playing field a little bit and look at the gaps that are there. And as you're talking about, obviously there's a lot of issues to sort through, including exactly how this will be implemented. What would a nationalized childcare system look like? I know you've been speaking to advocates about this. What are they saying would be the, the right way of implementing this? As I mentioned earlier, advocates use healthcare as an example. So something governed by a national act, national oversight, but deployed in collaboration with the provinces and territories and and some accountability to the money. So if funding is coming from the federal government, they want to see that tied to quality, consistency, that kind of thing, you know, an accountability instead of just a cash flow. Because, and this is kind of tied to that, but many advocates want to see a focus on publicly run childcare as opposed to private companies to add an extra layer of accountability. They're not saying to get rid of all the private childcare services that are out there right now, but sort of from now on to focus on the public ones. I think, you know, we've seen in the conversation about long-term care during COVID-19 that there's, again, a focus on, on, on wanting to turn to publicly run companies for that. And I think that the same focus is seen in childcare advocacy. Currently, you know, the provinces all have their own systems for subsidizing childcare, but these have their limits. So there's often a wait list for one, and they're also only available to a certain income bracket. So by subsidizing it at the source, as affordable childcare could be a lot more accessible for a lot more families. And I brought this up before, but as well, these, these subsidies don't take into account physical accessibility, right? So a national program could take into account the needs of more rural communities, as well as the overall balance of childcare spaces according to demand and, and hopefully remedy those gaps. 
And you also mentioned in your piece that child care and the care sector overall also has its set of issues, which is it's primarily run by women and a lot of women of color as well. And the issues that you talked about, can you give me a bit of detail about that as well? And is reform needed internally as well for this kind of strategy to work? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, the care sector, which would include child care, it also includes long term care, is overwhelmingly staffed by women and especially women of color. And these jobs are known for being precarious. It's one of the reasons that we've seen job loss higher for women, but also job recovery lower for women. Many women would work multiple gigs at up to 80 hours a week, and yet they don't have job stability, benefits, or good wages. They're essentially paid like a part-time employee for working basically double that of a full-time, right? So, and then this means, you know, it's instability for them, obviously, is makes for a difficult life, right? That's not something that anyone would wish for themselves. It also means there's a high turnover rate in the sector, which leads to a lower quality of care. So advocates say that a national child care strategy needs to address child care workers in terms of better training, compensation, and job stability, which would not only improve the lives of the workers, of course, of women and women of color, but also of the child care that they provide. So it's kind of a benefit for everyone. It's sort of an inside out approach. Exactly. I, I think what they, they say, you know, that the quality of care is directly related to the quality of the job, right? So if someone, I think this goes for any industry, if someone's not being compensated fairly, or if they're working really hard for a low wage, for low benefits, and it's a precarious job, I think it goes without saying that the quality of the work that they're able to provide is also likely to go down. Rosa, are there any successful models or examples on the international front, possibly, that we can look to that have already implemented the system and successfully? So Quebec is what we often turn to here in Canada because it's a Canadian example and and it's been running for long enough that we can actually see the results. So it's not a perfect system. When it comes to public and private, advocates would say there's too many private daycare services in Quebec and they'd like to see that change but it still had quite an impact on women's participation in the economy. So a couple of years ago, Statistics Canada put out a report that compared labor force participation and some other markers between Ontario and Quebec, you know, specifically looking to, to find out the effect of childcare in Quebec. And they found that despite higher fertility rates in Quebec, which would obviously lead to higher rates of childbirth, the female labor force participation actually increased at a faster pace in Quebec than in Ontario, especially among women with young children. The study also found that by directly funding childcare through the government, instead of reducing costs through tax credits or subsidies, as was the case before 1997, the childcare program in Quebec became more accessible to low-income families, which is one of the benefits I mentioned earlier. The advocates have called it a game changer for Quebec, not just for women's economic participation, but for other related markers such as child poverty. And then in Norway, something I'm slightly less familiar with, but from what I understand, subsidized childcare there is tightly integrated with education, family leave, parental benefits, which advocates say is a good platform to sort of tackle all the interrelated issues that come along with parenting. Thank you so much, Rosa Saba. It's always so great to have you. Thank you. I was talking to the Toronto Star's business reporter, Rosa Saba, about a potential national child care strategy. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Saba Itazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. If you want to hear what stories matter to you, please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.